library, and as I make my brief introduction, this is your sign to silence your phone. But if you are into tweeting or Facebooking, please leave your phones on and take pictures. And if you are into tweeting, use hashtag CSS Think Possible. All right? Um, we are so lucky to have this series here, and it is really due to our, um, our co-sponsors with this program that allows this to happen, and that is the Hearst Media and the Dylan Schneider Group. And with that, I'm going to introduce Joe Pisano from the Dylan Schneider Group. Thank you, Alice. This is quite a crowd. And on Friday, I thought for sure this would have been the first one that we canceled because of rain. <laughs> but to borrow a term from Deborah Norville, Think Possible, and her new book which just came out today is available to that. Deborah Norville is the anchor of Inside Edition, and she's a two-time Emmy <laughs> Award winner and best-selling author. This year, she celebrated her 20th anniversary as anchor. <laughs> now, when she started, the only Kardashian in the news was Robert Kardashian in the O.J. Simpson trial. And there's a wonderful video chronicling her 20 years at Inside Edition Online, you can see. And she talks about breaking news over the course of the years, but most importantly, she talks about changes in hairstyle during that time. Um, what makes Deborah Norville such an exceptional journalist, to my thinking, is that you can trust her. I was in journalism for 30 years, and you realize that sometimes you, there aren't many journalists you can trust. There is one. That counts for a lot in modern America, in America, but it goes beyond trust. Her topic tonight is civility, the power of thank you, mutual respect, and thinking possible. I don't know anything else that describes the civility crisis in America better than that. Such fundamental things as saying thank you, as respecting other people, are important to her. And these are the foundations of civility. She joined Inside Edition in 1995 from CBS News, where she was anchor and correspondent. She's the former co-host of, of NBC's Today and anchor of NBC News at Sunrise. During the course of her career, she has hosted the primetime Deborah Norville Tonight on the MSNBC and the national Deborah Norville Show on ABC Talk Radio Network. Inside Edition is the country's top-rated and most honored syndicated news magazine. And the ratings jumped 15% the week she joined the program. Throughout her tenure, the show is consistently ranked in the top 10 television shows in first-run syndication. And Inside Edition reaches a daily audience of just under 5 million viewers. Join me in welcoming Debra Norman. <laughs> but I know I am speaking to um, the choir on this one because you guys deal with uh, that lovely freeway every day. It is such a thrill to be here. And Bob, I want to thank you and Jan for inviting me. I know this has been a passion of yours um, dating back since before you were friends with Father Theodore Hesburgh at um, Notre Dame University. This is a man who who walks the civility walk, and so I'm very grateful to you for this, um, everybody in the community, I think I speak on their behalf and say, it's wonderful that you personally championed this, this lecture series, and I was really complimented that you wanted me to be a part of it. Um, it's actually very sad that we need a civility lecture series, isn't it? I mean, that isn't what our founding fathers really had in mind when they came up with this great experiment called the United States of America, but sadly, uh, human nature is what it is, and because human nature is what it is, I have the opportunity to write darling little books like the one that just came out today called Think Possible. It's just 101 stories that at the end of the tale leave you thinking, you know what? He was. Maybe I can. And that's really been the mantra that has informed my entire life and certainly my professional life. I come from, I'm pretty sure, the town where this rug was made. I recognize this pattern. <laughs> I know the fiber it's made out of. This is a polyester. It is um, a very good polyester. It's long wearing. Um, I believe that came from Mark Lauberbaum's daddy's business that he's now running. And Mark was two years older than me in Dalton High School. I know this rug. 
<laughs> and the reason I know this is because I come from a little town called Dalton, Georgia. It's in the northwest part of the state. It is where um, carpeting really was invented. Wall wall carpeting first um, emanated from there. And used to be the statistic was in my hometown, we made enough carpeting on an annual basis to be the six-lane highway around the equator. <laughs> and when you come from Dalton, Georgia, that is how you would say that, which is something I had to immediately give up if this aspiration of being in television was ever going to come to fruition. And so I got rid of the accent, I got an education, and got myself a job in television. But all along, the whole thing that guided me was, gee whiz, maybe I can. Even though across the board it always seemed like the odds were stacked against me. Dalton, Georgia may have carpet mills, but it doesn't have much else. If you weren't the guy that made the carpet, you were the postman or the dentist or the doctor for the person who did. Um, my daddy didn't make it, but he sold all the stuff he needed to make it. So that's where we fit into the ecosystem there. Uh, we barely had a radio station. We certainly didn't have a television station. We had a couple of channels from Atlanta, and sometimes if the wind was blowing in the right direction, we got Chattanooga, Tennessee. And so when I came home from this little contest and aspired to be a television journalist, there was no one in my ecosystem that said, hey, Deb, that's a great idea. You can do it. But I thought it might be possible. And so I studied the people. And remember, we had libraries. We didn't have the internet. You couldn't go and Google somebody, because Google was a number that went to infinity. It wasn't a verb. And so the only way I could find out about people who worked in television, worked in television was to scour the young magazines and try to find information about those folks and try to emulate their career choices as best I could. Um, being in Georgia with not a whole lot of money for <coughs> education. In fact, my entire college education cost less than $10,000. I went to the University of Georgia, I tested out in one year, it was $3,000 a year tuition and extra if you wanted to pay for the, um, the food part of it, but I didn't think that that was something I needed to be wasting money on, so I didn't eat. And we had budgeted a certain amount for every quarter, how much it should cost me to eat, and I miscalculated or ate too much. And the end of my freshman first quarter, I ran out of money, and I literally went through freshman final exams, subsisting on Weiler's lemonade mix and a gigantic um, Costco type of box of cornflakes. So when I get served a really fancy meal, or Mr. Dylan Schneider sent a very nice car to bring me up here. I am incredibly grateful. Which is the other thing that has really informed my life. And that is always finding something for which to be grateful. And for me, that also was, as much as anything, a coping mechanism. Because my family life wasn't exactly um, the American storybook. My parents were married. Um, and, and until I was in high school, they got, my parents got divorced. But when I was eight years old, my mother got sick. She um, had a benign tumor removed from her spine and had to relearn to walk. And so I was eight, my older sister was ten, and we were six and four. So with four little girls at home, my mother had to sleep in the first floor family room because she couldn't negotiate the stairs yet. But she learned to walk. And within two years, she was stricken with rheumatoid arthritis. And so once again, she had to relearn how to do everything. We um, retrofitted the refrigerator so that we put one of daddy's old neckties and you could stick your arm through it and use your body weight like that to open. Some of you have um, people with mobility issues in your family. You could do like that to get the refrigerator to open. No need to close the drawers all the way because if you left it slightly ajar, you could just put your hand like that and use the force of your arm to open up the drawers. So we learned how to do stuff so that it made life easier for mom. But it didn't make life easy for us. But even in those difficult times, as a little kid, I found things to be grateful for. At the end of school day, when all the moms would be lined up to do the pickup at the end of school, if I saw my mom's green station wagon in there, that was something to be grateful for. Because it meant mom felt well enough to get in the car and drive and get me. And if at um, the uh, survey of the line, there was no green station wagon, you knew to just go find a friend and bum a ride home. And that's how we did it. We made it work. And so things went on. My mother got progressively um, more disabled. Uh, she was bedridden by the time I was 16. That's when Daddy walked out. My parents were divorced. And then it was in a contest where she was the mom in the wheelchair, and I was the one representing Georgia. But even then, I found something to be grateful for. Because when your mom is the one in the wheelchair, she gets parked right in front. And she got to see me better than any other set of parents got to see their daughter on stage. So even then, I found something to be grateful for. And when she died, when I was 20, still in college, 
literally on the day her first grandchild was due to be born. You know, there's that thing that God takes one and brings another that certainly works in our family. The day my mom died, I was able to find something to be grateful for because I knew she was no longer in pain. And I also had the satisfaction of knowing that she had seen me on television, which I think as a parent is something that I would have found very, very gratifying. And so I have always used what if and thank you as really the two mantras that have guided me through life. And certainly my career has had its ups and downs, and that's all been talked about more than we need to. But this idea of gratitude and possibility, is there anything to it? A few years ago, and you very kind of mentioned the Kardashians, and yes, once only Bob Kardashian was the one we know about. But before the Kardashians, we were paying a lot of attention to people like Britney Spears. Remember when Britney Spears shaved off her head and was beating that car with the umbrella? And was getting tattoos in places that no one should be publicly exposing. Um, during that period of time, of course, we were reporting on Britney, um, on Britney Spears, and it just bugged the heck out of me that we were spending so much time talking about Britney Spears. And let's face it, would it take any of you more than seven seconds to write an intro into Britney Spears has gone wacky again, here's the latest? Of course not. And that's what I was spending most of my time at work doing, which means I had a lot of free time. And I'm one of these people, if I have free time on my hands, I tend to get into other people's business, which is not a good thing for me to do. And I was starting to bug people and kind of get on the wrong foot with some people. And so I said, you know what, you need to dial it back. You need to find another way to occupy yourself because you do actually have to show up at work. And I started thinking, you know, my life goes better when I focus on what's working as opposed to fixating on the stuff that goes wrong. You know, we all do that. We tend to get, I used to keep a list of things that would go wrong on the show, the idea being that we'll address these issues and we'll fix them later. And I realized this list was just dragging me down. Because all it was was a list of negatives. And so sort of ancillary to that, I thought, you know, my life does go better when I focus on what's working. But I'm a journalist. I'm a skeptic. I'm a paid professional skeptic. I've bought one bumper sticker in my life. A million years ago when I was in college, I went to a journalism convention and uh, they were selling bumper, bumper stickers at one of those tables and I bought one that said, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. <laughs> That's pretty good. I, I wish I still had it. It fell apart a thousand years ago. But that is kind of the way I go. Well, is there anything to it? Yeah, sure, you focus on good stuff, you think you feel better, but it's just a placebo effect in your mind. So I said, let's research it, because I'm sort of like a research freak. I like to do that stuff. I actually literally would read the dictionary when I was a little kid. And one of my greatest regrets about the stupid internet is our children go directly and look things up. Because you find something very interesting if you start at A and you're on your way to M. You know, you run into, I don't know, Calypso along the way. And you learn about this type of Calypso dancing. Um, kids don't do that anymore. But I started researching this idea of putting your mind on positive things and what possible impact it could have on you. And once you get past that, past that initial self-help, silliness of if you see it, you can be it. Because I see myself 15 pounds lighter, but if I don't move, nothing's going to happen to that anymore. You get past that stuff and you get into the <coughs> academic, peer-reviewed journals that are out there. There was so much meat. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And one study that really nailed me was one that had been done at UC Davis. And the co-researcher was a guy from the University of Miami. And it was a very simple study. And we could actually sort of replicate it here. This group of people in the room, every day you're going to write down three to five things that you thought were blessings in your life or good things, and you might make a note why it was a good thing. So if you were late for work, you hit green lights the whole way you wrote that down. This group is going to write stuff that's sort of neutral. You know, you went grocery shopping or you bought new shoes. That doesn't really evoke a lot of emotion. You'll write three to five sort of emotion neutral things. And then this group is going to write the negative stuff and why it was a negative. And, um, it's pretty obvious the people in the negative group are going to, their mood is going to go down, not much change for you. And as expected, the positive people felt better about their life. What everybody had also been doing, along with their little list of um, good, bad, or indifferent things, they were keeping a list of, did you exercise? If so, how much? Were you healthy? Were you sick? If you were sick, did you take medication? What did you take? Did you drink? Did you drink a lot? How much did you drink? How are you getting on your to-do list? Do you feel like you're getting things done? Do you feel like you're behind? In terms of life goals, where are you? So very specific questions like that. And they asked everybody to give the names of two people they see every day. So it might be your assistant at work. It might be your best friend that you have coffee with every day. Unbeknownst to the people in the study, about three weeks in, they went to those associates 
and said, hey, you noticed anything different? Sorry, Bob, you're in the negative group. Oh, Dana had some really choice things to say about you. But Amy over here was in the positive group. And Amy's assistant said, you know, I don't know what's gotten into her lately, but I've noticed she's been, like, ridiculously helpful. She was finished with what she had to do. She was ready to go. I was still hung up on a project, and she stuck around and helped me. Like I say, she's a nice person, but this was way out of character for her. They noticed a change in behavior. And that's what got me, because if you're in a study, you can figure out what you're studying. But those people didn't know that Amy and Bob and the rest of you guys were doing a study. And that's when I really dove in and found that there is not only a difference in behavior, that difference in behavior changes the way you process things. And that's when I got really fascinated about the power of the mind. When you focus on those things for which you're grateful, the people in the gratitude group, exercised on average an hour and a half more per week. Those people felt like they were getting more of their to-do list done. People who were around them noticed them being more pro-social, more helpful, more outgoing and willing to extend themselves. There was, they, they weren't sick as much. They didn't take as many aspirin and Advil and, and uh, Claritin because they were writing down about their allergy attacks and stuff. All in all, they had a much better quality of life than the people in the other two groups. I went further in the research. People who feel good, you guys know about the dopamine effect, right? You know, the, the runner's high? People who feel good, who write the three things down every day, have that sort of gratitude thing going, and it turns out those people who are in positive affect, as the shrinks talk about it, actually are smarter. It activates this part of your brain. This is the cognitive association, executive function part of your brain. All your decisions, all your good thinking comes here. And when you feel good, you have actually made yourself better able to make smart decisions for you. Um, one professor uses the analogy of like you've got a tube that's this big, and you've got to reach through that tube to get to the information. But when you're in positive affect, it's as though you broaden the size of that tube. You can reach right in there, grab the information you need, and you can make associations that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Well, I put some of these findings in a little book, and I called it Thank You Power, because to me, gratitude is power. And that book made the best sellers list in this country. That book made the best sellers list in Korea. That book made the best sellers list in Australia. I have gotten letters and gifts from people from Southeast Asia. I got an email from someone that was time-stamped to something in the morning that said, thank you, or thank you, Power. I think you've saved my life. So I knew then, these ideas, these simple ideas, but incredibly profound ideas about how we can use our mind in very easy ways, not like, you know, scientific and wire yourself up kind of ways, but in very easy ways that fit in nicely with all of our lives, we could change our lives and we could enhance the quality of our lives. And so shortly thereafter that, this very nice lady here, Amy Newmark, I'll introduce her, she is the publisher of the Chicken Soup, Soup for the Soul yeah. series, reached out to me and said, you know, I love what you're doing about gratitude. Let's do a book called Think Positive, which we did. And it's 101 stories about blessings. And in the forward in this book, and I just wrote the forward for this book. She did all the other heavy lifting. I just wrote the forward, kind of teed it up for all the good stuff that she was doing. But what you didn't know was my, my cousin was, um, and none of us know it actually, was dying of multiple sclerosis. And so to be able to share his story um, in this forward, um, in a way that honored him for his family was a blessing. So thank you for that opportunity, and I'm happy to be able to say that in front of this wonderful group of people. And so we stayed in touch, and this whole idea of, whoa, all it took was my curiosity and studying these ideas about gratitude. Wow, what if? What if we looked at other things? And as Bob knows so well, I go crazy about the disrespect in our society. And again, I was, was kind of influenced by what was making the headlines on Inside Edition. After we've gotten Brittany into rehab and out and she was all better and Lindsay Lowen went off the deep end and kind of tried to deal with her and decided that might have been a hopeless case. Then I started focusing on all these other people. Remember the congressman from South Carolina who yelled at President Obama, you lie, during a joint session of Congress? Disagree with what he says but in a civil way, and that's not how you do it, and you certainly respect the office of the President of the United States. I was horrified, but it didn't take me long to be horrified yet again, 
because that was when Serena went off on the Lions judge at the U.S. Open. This all happened within about a three-month period. And shortly thereafter, there was a little high school girl down in Orlando, Florida, who was invited over to her friend's house for a sleepover one Friday night. She comes in the door, the house, the door closes behind her. Hey, guys, how are you? The next thing she knows, she is being pummeled by her friends who are stupid enough to record this and put it on YouTube. And so after she gets out of here with damaged hearing, um, massive injuries to her face, black eyes, you know, like her face had been rearranged, she recovered from her injuries. But she had been seriously assaulted. The cops saw this video online. They searched out these girls. And these kids were put on trial, as they should be. But what does it say about our society? The kids think that's a fun way to entertain themselves on a Friday night? I thought maybe I could dig around in the research and find something. And I've learned that no one's going to do it. As a journalist, what I really am is a professional observer of human behavior. You know, they pay me to watch what people do. And honestly, at Inside Edition, on a daily basis, I found myself saying to my stage manager, you know what? If it weren't for stupid people, we would be out of a job. Because <laughs> so much of what happens is just stupid and often with tragic results. Today we had a story about a young man who will spend the next seven years in prison from right up the road here in New Britain, Connecticut. He tossed a firecracker as a prank into the window of a girl that he claimed was a friend of his. She was asleep in her bed, the house caught fire, and she died. And he will serve only seven years and probably more likely five under the terms of the plea deal. And this girl will never be back. She will never see her 20th birthday. Her mother will not get to see her walk down the aisle. Her mother will not get to become a grandmother because of a child she has. A life cut short because of somebody being stupid? Would it be possible that I could do anything to influence? I don't think I can make stupid people smart. But might I be able to make people behave differently <coughs> if they saw an advantage in it to themselves? Because I realize nobody does the right thing because it's the right thing. Maybe all of the exception, but most people do. <laughs> but people will do the right thing if they see something in it for them. So in businesses, if you simply <coughs> treat people with respect, even if you've got a fire, Fire them with respect. Say, we, we are very sorry it's not working out. You've been an admirable employee. Our needs have changed. You're not the right person for us. We want to make this easy for you. We've arranged this, that, and the other. We've given you this much time, but if you're more comfortable leaving out, there are ways to disengage employees in a thoughtful manner. And when you do that, companies don't lose as much money because they don't get sued and they don't have the huge cost of all the collateral, ugh, collateral damage that goes on. For instance, remember the GM lawsuit many years ago? GM ultimately ended up spending, I think it was $43 million in settling what became a large class action lawsuit. A lawsuit that started because one African American employee felt that she had been unfairly passed over for a promotion and her pleas to have been heard on that one issue pertaining only to herself were ignored. And additional employees found that they too were being ignored. And had they simply been paid attention to, treated with respect, and maybe she wasn't promoted because she wasn't the right person. Maybe she was the right person for the job, and it was, it was um, uh, discriminatory that she wasn't. But because there was never engagement, she never was heard. When employees are heard, they don't sue. So there was a great way we could make the case that respect in business made a difference. Respect in your relationships. How many of us have kids that behave the way they're supposed to? Kids are kids that do with only, but if you reward the behavior, treat those kids with respect when they do the right thing, they actually will do more of the right thing. So I wrote that book. And so then this idea of exploring possibilities was presented to me. And for me, it's always been about the what if, what would happen, how come. And the question how come is one that really brought me to journalism as a career. When I was in fourth grade, I had my favorite teacher, Mrs. Eddings. And it's so perfect that we're here um, in a library tonight because really my journalism career began in my fourth grade school library. Because Mrs. Eddings would do these great lectures, and they were so interesting. And I would always raise my hand and say, well, Mrs. Eddings, how come? And she'd stop what she was doing, 
and you know, let me ask my question, I would ask my question, she would answer it, it got her off her rhythm. Next time, hand up, I'd ask her a question, it got her off her rhythm. Finally, she says, you know, Daddy, that's a really good question. Why don't you go down to the hall to the library and look it up? So we'll all know what the answer is. And it took me about three trips to the library. Oh, not just look it up, do a report. <laughs> right? Do like a whole big report with like footnotes. I didn't know what a footnote was in fourth grade. All that bibliography stuff. So I would go to the library, I would make a report. And it took me about three reports to realize what Mrs. Eddings was doing. was just trying to get me out of her hair, which worked. Um, and she was able to teach the class the way she wanted to. But what neither Mrs. Eddings nor I realized at that time, it wasn't until many years later that I did, what she was doing was giving me my career. She was teaching me that anything I wondered, I had the ability to go and find out. And I was limited only by my own energy, and my own curiosity, and my own willingness to keep digging until I found out what it was I wanted to know. And isn't that what a journalist does? And so that's where this next book came from. Think possible. And it's a little bit of a, you would think, sort of the same as Think Positive. In fact, we almost had like a near disaster at work today. We did a story on, on the book, and we featured three people whose stories are in here, which I'm going to tell you about. But the guy in graphics said, oh, I found a really pretty blue cover. And he was going to use the blue cover, and he's like, no, that's the ancient book. This is the new book. And it's so cute, if you can see in the back. It's got a little bitty kitty looking in a mirror, and what the little bitty kitty sees in the mirror is a tiger. And, um, and I love that. How many of us don't look in the mirror and we see something different from what the rest of the world sees? We see our potential. We see our possibilities. And we also see that they're not yet realized. And so what is it that we can do to help ourselves realize our possibilities? And that was sort of my mindset as I went into this project with Amy. And we went through more than 400, maybe close to 450 individual stories that people around the country had submitted, which are their own tales of how they thought something was possible, oftentimes in the face of an entire circle of people around them who didn't. And the book begins with the story of a little girl who, with her sisters, would watch the Cinderella show on television every year when it came on. That was the one with Leslie Ann Warren, if you guys remember. Now it's on Broadway. You can see it with all the staging and the beautiful music of Rogers and Hammerstein. But did you know there's that song in there? Impossible. Impossible for a plain yellow pumpkin to become a golden carriage. Impossible. And that little girl sang that song too. Only though for her, the song was Impossible for a no one from Georgia to become a news reporter. <laughs> Impossible because nobody gave me encouragement. And yet I persevered, made some lucky breaks, and had some good people who were kind to me and gave me chances, and here I am today. And my story is like old and people have heard it. But maybe you haven't heard the story of Michael Wary. Michael Wary is a high school sophomore. He lives kind of near Cleveland, uh, Ohio, Elyria, Ohio, I think is probably the closest big city where he is. And um, Michael's an amazing young man. Michael sets pretty lofty goals for himself. I mean, he's still in high school. And even though he's only a sophomore, he's already an Eagle Scout. Yeah. Um, anybody have kids or grandkids or brothers who were Eagle Scouts? It's a huge, my nephew is, it's a huge, huge undertaking. And for your kid to make Eagle Scout is gigantic. So Michael's an Eagle Scout. Michael as saw, you know, as a little kid, he saw what the high school marching band was doing with the great uniforms and the precision marching. Remember, this is Ohio. They got Ohio State, as I know about formations. <laughs> and uh, he said, I want to be in a high school band. So trumpet was his instrument. He also plays the piano. But uh, Michael tried out for the high school band, and he made it. And he gets to be in those formations. He goes this way and that way and does all those things. And when Michael was younger, as most little boys want to do, Michael said, I want to ride a bike. And uh, I don't even think anybody would say, I oh, can't ride a bike. But I don't have people in this world that said, I don't ever ride a bike. Michael rides a bike. Um, Michael's a part of his high school ROTC. Um, Michael aspires, oh, he's an honor student. He's carrying a 3.75 GPA in high school. It's pretty good. He needs one B somewhere along the way. Um, probably because he's practicing his trumpet too much. And Michael aspires to go to the University of Pennsylvania um, and study at the Wharton School. 
and with a 3.75 GPA, he's probably got a pretty good shot at it. Although most people would say he doesn't, because Michael also has one more thing. He has autism. And yet Michael calls autism his superpower. Rather than looking at it as a deficit, as something that's going to keep him from reaching his goals, Michael has always regarded what everybody else around him, the naysayers, the detractors would say, is an absolute roadblock to any goal he has in life. Michael has seen autism as that secret weapon that's going to help him not only reach those goals, but reach those goals, at least in his case, much earlier than many of the other students in his grade. Michael is one of the stories here in Think Possible. And Michael was on national television today. In fact, Michael's going to be on TV here in the Gregg area in just a few minutes when Inside Edition comes on. Um, I am so proud to share that young man's story because he wrote his story himself. He submitted it and it was like one of the first ones that Amy and I said, this one's going in. We've got to put this story in there. And this young man is so exceptional. He's actually made a movie about himself, not because he thinks he's, as my little girl would say, all that. He's made this movie about himself, and he's put it out there on YouTube. And if you've got anybody in your family or a friend who is dealing with the challenge of having an autistic child, and they think, oh, God, woe is me, Michael made this movie for that person. Because this movie is designed to help parents and grandparents and associates of anybody who's dealing with the diagnosis of autism know just how great that individual has the potential to be. Not possible are not words in this young man's vocabulary. And this book is filled with those kinds of stories. And the reason it's important, and I'm not here to hawk books, actually, we didn't even plan on doing a book thing. I was just going to come up here and talk about possibility and civility. But the reason it's important to have these kinds of books in our library and close at hand to read is because when we read these stories, we are uplifted, we are brightened, our world is enhanced, we have the psychological upward spiral that the shrinks talk about. And the reason that's important is because each of us who looks in the, in the mirror and sees the tiger that hasn't yet come out, has the possibility of making that tiger come out when they know it could be possible. And that's what I contributed to the forward. There's actually research that um, I was really thrilled to find. Because it, again, it was a hunch, but sometimes hunches don't pan out. And not every hunch I had in looking for data for this um, turned out to reveal what I had hoped it would. But in this case, it did. And the data shows that there's sort of two processes to making a decision and acting on that decision. There's the deliberative phase, where you think about what it is you want to do, and you get all your information and the pros and the cons, you weigh it, maybe get outside um, input, and you, you deliberate and then you make your decision. And once you've made that decision, it's as though you've gone over a little speed hump, or a big speed hump in many cases. And the fact that you have made that decision and you now have a goal the fact that you have articulated that goal in your mind, and perhaps you've even written it down. For me, if I don't write it down, it doesn't happen. But once you've got that goal in mind, you actually have moved into the next phase in which you are, according to the data, able to filter out the distractions. It's as though you've put on blinders, not in a negative way, in that you're not going to see opportunities on the periphery, but you put on blinders that enable you to keep that goal front of mind simply by deciding you are going to do it. Now, you're not any closer to reaching that goal, but mentally, the fact that you have made that decision actually enables you to be less likely to be dissuaded by the naysayers and the detractors and the people that are out there. And the other thing that's really cool about this, there's, there's separate data out there, research that shows that once you've made that goal and you're moving in that direction, you actually kind of put on rose-colored glasses the situation to someone else may look kind of bleak. And when they say, oh, I don't know, I don't think so, they're not trying to be mean and prevent you from, you know, attaining the goal. They genuinely, out of welfare for you, think, oh, this might not be a good idea. You are able to not see the potential problems in a way that will make you put on weight. You're actually able to keep moving forward simply by deciding you know what? I'm going to do it. And 
fact, there's other data that shows once you've made that decision, you actually have the possibility of, of kind of enhancing your, your physical health. It's not quite as strong as the, the experiment with the gratitude, where the people write this stuff down. But once you've done that, you have what the psychologists call positive illusions, and you actually are able to kind of insulate yourself from not only the naysayers, but also from some of those forces that would bring you down emotionally. So that you're able to keep that energy about you and that enthusiasm for whatever your goal is. And so what a book like Think Possible does really and truly, it just gives you a little bit of gas. It's, um, it's like a big old piece of sugar that you give to a kid, you get them all riled up and revved up. If you need to be revved up, reading these kinds of little stories enable you to do that. And the reason I think it's so important to get back to the theme of this series on civility, is when we are focusing on positive goals, positive outcomes, things that will make us as individuals better. If we as individuals are all striving to grow personally, we are also growing our society in the same way if there were more positivity. And I think that's frankly one reason the Chicken Soup series has been one of the most successful literary efforts, you know, outside the Bible. And, uh, have you sold more than Harry Potter? Okay, well, Valdemore's at work. Um, Harry Potter's winning right now, but it's, it's a close contest. Um, but that's an amazing thing. And the fact that that many books that really just speak to those very quiet little positive attributes that we all hold dear says something about the longing we have in our society. And we see it right now. We see a presidential campaign that, yes, um, and this is probably a good thing, has started sooner in the process than certainly I can remember. And I've been covering news events for a very long time. But the level of negativity is also so much higher, so much earlier in the process. And in fact, in you were probably in the car today, you may not have heard this. Newsflash, Donald Trump apologized. Oh. Yeah, wow. And here's what Donald Trump apologized for. Last um, February, when the Oscars were on, um, Kim Novak made a very rare public appearance in which she appeared on stage with Matthew McConaughey and presented one of the Oscar awards, one of the Academy Awards. And um, she is now, I think, she's over 80. And um, Donald Trump tweeted out that he thought it was difficult to watch television because of her physical appearance. And that she should sue his, her plastic surgeon. Oh. Um, why do you need to say that? Why do you need to share that with the world? And Donald only has 4.36 million Twitter followers. If you feel that, say it to your wife sitting on the couch with you. Say it to the butler who's bringing you the drink on the silver tray or the golden tray maybe in Donald's house. But don't put it out there in the world. And the world doesn't care, but one person did care. And she cared deeply. And she was bitterly hurt. And when she saw that backstage at the Academy Awards, when she left the facility that night, she went back to her cabin of her home in Oregon, and she did not leave for months. What an awful thing to do to somebody. And a few weeks ago, she was on, um, I'm blanking on the gentleman's name, but the guy who does the, 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 the TCM uh, movies, uh, Robert, you've got uh, Silver Hair, you know what I mean? Osborne. Osborne, thank you, yes, Robert Osborne. And, um, and she spoke about that, and she said, we need to stand up to the bullies and tell them we're not going to take that anymore. And her comment got back to Donald Trump, who, in as much of a way as Mr. Trump, I believe, allows himself to be apologetic, because he actually is a nicer person than I think he portrays sometimes on the stage, he said that he said it in good fun, but if it was hurtful to someone, he was sorry he said it. So I don't know if that's an apology to Ms. Novak or not, um, but I guess that's as close as we get. But it really speaks to what's going on in our society today. We're all of us with this device, and yes, we, we love to share our photos and tweet out our things, and I hope you're having fun here tonight. But please don't say something mean if you're not. Um, but you can write me personally and tell me if 
what I could have done to make your evening more enjoyable. Um, but when we have kids who send out a tweet as their final message before they decide to commit suicide, when we have children who are too afraid to go to school because of the comments that they're hearing both online and behind their back, when we have grown-ups who are being bullied at work for their appearance, for their accent, for the way they style their hair, and this does happen, and we do stories about it, there's something wrong. And each of us, in our own way, can be part of the solution to the lack of civility in our country. In a lot of ways, if you come to a lecture on civility, you know, you are preaching to the fire. But you can say to someone who acts in a less than civil manner, you could ask them why. You could model a better type of behavior. You can just put it out there in the universe. Positive thinking, positive quotes. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Um, and I know I wasn't invited here to say that I have the answer. But what I've tried to contribute in my own little way are little messages of positivity, little messages of hope, the idea that when you do set your mind on positive things, good things will happen as a result. Um, I want to open it for questions because I think it's more fun when you guys are talking. And um, you can speak up loud because this is a quiet room everybody can hear. But this nice lady in the middle has a microphone. But I'd love to and, um, throw it open for questions if anybody has any. Everybody's in fifth grade. Nobody ever wants to be in the first one. Yes, sir. From Fordham University. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but it seems to me that it's easier to, at least for me, to um, tell her the negative thoughts about myself mm -hmm. than positive thoughts. If that's true, I think that's why do you think it's more, it takes more effort than positive than negative thoughts? Can I let you in on a secret? Almost every day, I hate myself. Um, I think we all do it. I think it's human nature. Um, I think we are so much, our, our failures are this big, and our successes are this big, in our own mind. You know, it's like those mirrors at the funny house when you stand in front of that one mirror and it makes you look like this. Um, in our own minds, our failures, we always see them in, in that funny house mirror. And that's why I think it's so important. For me, when I left the Today Show, I kind of got like booted out. I, I jumped before they pushed me, but it was the same thing. I was out of a job. And I went through a very big depression. This man right here was incredibly helpful. Bob Dillenschneider was a friend to me when not many other people were. And I've always been grateful to you. I'm delighted to have neighbors here. You know, what a, what a loyal man you are. Um, and I didn't leave the house. He came over to my house because I wasn't leaving my house. I did not leave my house for over six weeks. I literally did not. It was like him Novak without the Donald Trump tweet. Um, I only left to take my newborn baby across the street to be a pediatrician. And what got me back on track and got me out of this, it wasn't a pity party, I was, I was depressed. It was, I did my own brand of cognitive behavioral therapy. And, and what it started with was knowing who I am. And, and I realized that I lost sight of who I was. I'd allowed myself to be defined by what I did. Oh, I can anchor the Today Show. And it wasn't, oh, aren't I special, but I'm the anchor of the Today Show. I'm the fastest rising star on network television. I'm NBC's Golden Girl. I was all those little phrases they had in the paper. No, I'm Deborah Norville. I'm a whatever year old woman I was then. I'm, and who you are, if you think about it, I don't have a chalkboard behind me, but who, who you are is a wagon wheel. Who you are is that center hub, that center hub of the wheel. You've got to know who you are. And everything, every decision you make emanates out of that. What job you're going to take, what spouse you're going to have, what you're going to make for dinner, um, what hobbies you're going to do, what philanthropies you're going to support. Every decision comes out of that. But if you don't have that center hub figured out who you are, the moment you take your first step, that wheel's going to collapse because there's nothing to support it. And who you are is... And this was an exercise given me when I was 17. Take one piece of paper and I pass it on to each of you. One piece of paper, right at the top, who am I, question mark. Answer it in one page. And who you are is not a whatever your old anchor of inside edition. Who I am is a 57. 57-year-old mother of three, 
who believes that being a mother is one of the hardest jobs you'll ever have, but also one of the most gratifying. Who I am as a woman who believes that God put me on this earth for a reason, and it is my job to, to make sure that God knows he didn't screw up by letting me come here. Who I am as someone who believes I've been given so much, I have to find ways to give back. Who I am as someone who believes I'm a connector, I connect really cool ideas with people who might be able to benefit from them. I connect news stories uh, with people who need to know what's going on. I figured out who I am, and therefore the decisions I make are really easy. And so to that point of why do we look at our what we consider our failings to be so much bigger, it's kind of like the cat and the tiger, you know? We see ourselves negatively in a way, no one would, whatever it is, you know, you think about yourself, I am sure there's no one who would say that. Nobody in your life. I'm just, you know, I don't want to think about you. But I am sure that that is the case. And so that is why I, because I have dealt with depression, because I have been lower than low, make it a practice on a daily basis to read positive stuff. I write quotes all the time. I have quotes everywhere. Ask not, um, uh, let your will not be that events should happen. Ask not that events should happen as you will, but let your will be that events should happen and you will have peace. That's the Greek Epictetus. We can't, we can't control what happens in the world. We can control how we allow it to impact us. So when you take that mindset, and it's a deliberative, conscious, active thing you have to do, but you just tell yourself, you've got a strong mind in there. We all have an amazing mind. We don't let our mind do enough. You let your mind tell the rest of you, you know what? Today I'm going to make a great day. Today I'm going to make somebody smile. Today somebody's going to be glad that I came into contact with them. It's kind of like that, that stupid but hilarious um, 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 SNL skit. Uh, what's his name? Al Franken. And gosh, I love it. What was Is it Al Franken? Stuart Small. Stuart Small, yes. And gosh, you're, you're wonderful. It, it's kind of like that. Without all the schmaltz, you don't have to tell the people you're doing it. You do it all in your head. You know, it's all this stuff. I'm like, this call the silence, guys. Don't tell the people. I told you all this stuff. Um, but it really it has worked for me. I built my career back. No one would have bet 50 cents that Deborah Moore was ever going to be on TV after I left the Today Show. I started as a movie correspondent in CBS News. I built my way back, and it wasn't easy. And again, nobody thought it was possible, but. Shameless plug. I thought it was possible. <laughs> and it happened. And you can get out of that negative mindset that you find yourself. Because the thing about negative thoughts is negative thoughts go down the drain. Negative thoughts start a spiral, and their spiral goes that way. Um, positive thoughts start the spiral in the reverse. So start with one thing. But I really do commend you to, to get a little bitty book or do it on your cell phone and the notes thing. And just write down two, three good things every day. Um, I like a notebook because then it kind of randomly falls open somewhere, and, and I always feel like God wanted me to read that. Oh, yeah, that day the kids were watching the baseball game, and you had a really good glass of wine. I remember that day. <laughs> and it just puts me back in that spot. So that was a very long answer to a very important question that I apologize for taking so long. Anybody else? Um, two, um, two things. Um, when you, when, when you said you were in depression, was this because of the press coverage or when the press says negative things about you? Was that very hard to have, you know, your, what a dirty laundry, as they say, aired in public? Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't have any dirty laundry. That was the thing. Was so, my laundry was clean. Um, I had worked really hard. When they were saying all these horrible things about me, I won an Emmy Award for reporting on the Romanian Democratic Uprising. I mean, this was like I was a loser at work. Um, ratings had gone up 40%. I mean, it was great when I started out of here, 15% of hell, I'd done 40% at NBC. Um, it was just the weirdest thing in the world. The press was after me because I was younger and blonder than Jane Pauley. And right now, because I'm actually seeing Anthony on Thursday, I don't know the blonde is really the blonde thing <laughs> um, But the blonde thing was like, anybody could be my color blonde. This is very simple. And the younger thing, well, that's taking. You know, time is taking care of that. So, yes, the press was devastating because it was so unfair. There was one, um, one of those British reporters walked into my husband's office and announced in that British reporter accent that they have, 
We're here to get the dirt on Deborah Norville. <laughs> Dirt's outside in Central Park. There's nothing here for you. Um, and maybe one of the craziest was a, a female reporter. It's funny, the women were the worst um, offenders. A female reporter at the Detroit News wrote an opinion piece, because you know, opinion pieces, you can say stuff, you don't have the facts, you can just say what you want. And she wrote an opinion piece and said, I reminded her of the high school cheerleader who could do the entire football team. <laughs> And then ACE Calculus. Now I actually tested out trigonometry. I don't know what trigonometry is, but I took a test and they gave me college credit for it. So I think I probably could have ACE Calculus if I knew what that was. But the point, oh, oh, and then the other thing they said of me in that same article, and she's got this born again thing, dot, dot, dot. She must be stopped. So the fact that I was smart, the fact that I was a Christian, had also become thought of for the attack. So it was all so out of body, makes no sense that you couldn't really process it. So it just helped me get like massively depressed. Um, and I left after my, my child was born. So I was pregnant during all of this. The press reported I'd gotten pregnant to save my job, which that made zero sense. And uh, when my baby was born, um, and NBC had put a gag on me, they wouldn't let me respond to any of these crazy stories. And so when the baby was born, they, People Magazine said, hey, we want to do a story about your newborn. Well, who's going to say no to People Magazine? They always take pretty pictures, and this is your new baby, so of course, come on over. And they sent Harry Benson, the unbelievably talented and well-known photographer. And Harry's a really gifted photographer, but he works slow, and I was nursing the baby, and it was time to feed the baby, and he's still taking pictures. So he took a picture of me nursing the baby. I've got evening dresses that show more skin, but that was the one that really just set the people off in NBC. Deborah Norval, nursing in public. And one of the NBC PR people was quoted in the press as saying of that particular story of people, this will typecast Deborah in a motherhood role and be negative for her career. So for me, that was the final straw. That's when I saw that in black and white, and it may have said that being a mom was a career negative, but what I interpreted that to mean was, we don't want you to know, get the hell out. And so I obliged. It's kind of like, like this is a cliff right here, and at the bottom are 10,000 hungry alligators, and you're standing here on the cliff, and behind you are 500 guys running at you with bayonets. You can wait for the bayonet guys, or you can just jump and take your you know, chances with the alligators. So I, I jumped in with the alligators. Thanks, yes, sir. Maybe back to pot two. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. First thing in the morning, how do you get started? First thing in the morning, my darling husband brings me a cup of coffee, just the way I like it. And that is almost always my first grateful thing on my little list is that cup of coffee that Carl brings me. Um, I would like to tell you that I jump onto the machine and I do some running and I think great thoughts. I listen to my husband on the machine and think great thoughts. <laughs> I hate to work out. I know it's true. I got to figure that one out. Um, you know, the weirdest thing, so I'm just like a positive person, um, and you can learn to be. If they'd done this experiment like 20 years ago, I would not have done this. But they have a thing um, down at Viacom, and it's called the uh, Attention Experiment. And there's this gizmo that I did yesterday where you sit there and you watch these videos, and you've got three electrodes on your finger. One's measuring your heart rate, one's measuring your, your emotion, and, and, um, and the other one, I forget what it was doing, but anyway. It can tell your positivity uh, based on how you're sweating and, and how you're being read on these things. And you're watching the screen and it sees your eye movements because it's, it's tracking your eyes, you know, where you're looking at the screen. The entire time I was watching this video, from the pretty sea anemones and sea fans that were floating, to the woman who's walking on a piece of concrete about this wide, and she appeared to be about 400 feet above the ground, very scary stuff, to some nature scenes too. You guys know Terry, Laughing Baby, the Laughing Baby that laughs at the end, the paper tear. That was the last thing in it. And the whole time they said, "You were happy the whole time you watched this." There was a couple of moments when we think you died, um, and that would have been when the lady was on the, the scary high thing. I'm just a positive thing. And I have, a, and I said, "Can I please take a picture of that?" Which I did with my phone, so I could show my husband. So I can say, look, Carl, I really am a positive person. Because he gets mad at me and says, you're so darn upbeat. Um, but yeah, so that, uh, my morning is just like yours. Um, I get my cup of coffee. I watch whatever's on the news. Um, I'm usually running out the door late to work. And I get to work and I do my thing. There's nothing magical about it. Thank you. Thank you.
But I do take moments during the day and in that massive thing that I could be on Let's Make a Deal and I would, I would win money for because there's so much in my purse. But somewhere in there's a little bitty notebook that's got my little thank yous and gratitude to them. Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much. We'll see you all in November. Deborah will be in the back, and the books are in the back. Take care.